Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about monster design and cultural appropriation. Since this video is going to be released for October, it's something of a celebration of Halloween. However, this is not a manifesto. It's just a few important points to consider. Don't take it too seriously. And I mean, come on, Halloween, let's have a little fun. So I'd like to talk about the movie Over the Moon. Uh, at the making of this video, this movie hasn't been released yet. It's set to release in October 23, uh, 2020. So hopefully it's a good movie. <laughs> the trailer has already shown us several interesting items that I'd like to discuss. Uh, this movie is made by Pearl Animation Studio. It's a Chinese studio. Now, since this video is concerned with cultural appropriation, it might seem a little strange to look at a movie about Chinese culture made by a Chinese company. However, this company is somewhat of an arm of DreamWorks Pictures, um, and they actually made Kung Fu Panda 3, although I think their roots actually go all the way back to Kung Fu Panda. Furthermore, the crew for the movie is actually not all Chinese. If you look at the IMDB uh, entry here, you can see that a lot of those names aren't Chinese. However, the famous fashion designer Guo Pei is listed as designing the costumes. Now, what's the movie about? It's about the Mid-Autumn Festival, which is on the 15th day of the 8th month of the lunar calendar, which this year, 2020, is October 1st. So let's do a quick internet search with Baidu, a Chinese search engine, to look at some of the associated imagery. And you can see they have Chang'e, the moon, rabbits, mooncakes, and family. And it's important to understand what the culture of origin associates with this holiday. So you can see in the trailer, rabbits, more rabbits, the moon, and more rabbits. Uh, this actually is a traditional way of making a paper lantern. Those little people on the far on the bottom right, those are mooncake people. And the door behind them, when it closes, forms a crescent moon shape. And here they have what appear to be some Chinese guardian lions. Let's look at their Wikipedia entry to see a few more examples. So here it is. You've probably seen these statues before. They're fairly common. But let's check out the Chinese entry. If you look closely, the pictures are different because the Chinese entry has them always in pairs. That's actually really important. In the movie too, they're in pairs because they're supposed to guard the door and they're always together. That brings me to point number one, do your homework. It's important to look at a lot of source material, especially ones that come from the culture of origin. Now, let's look at Avatar. Avatar The Last Airbender was an animated show that came out in 2005. It has a lot of motifs that are East Asian in origin, but it has a strong focus on uh, Chinese culture. You can hear, see here some uh, architecture, religious iconography. Here, he's wearing a hat that comes out of the Ming Dynasty. It's something officials would wear. However, the show also used things out of the Qing Dynasty, and you can see that in their haircut. You've probably seen it in a few Kung Fu movies before. Here, she's wearing a Korean hanbok. The show mixes and matches a lot of different things from different countries and different periods. That's because the show doesn't actually take place in a real world setting. It takes place in a fantasy world where the four nations are. So it has a little more room to play fast and loose with the rules. Over the Moon takes place in China. So everything that they do has to make sense in that specific framework. On the other hand, Avatar has six-legged flying bison. So even if their Chinese dragons have wings, it's not a big deal because they're not actually in China. Even Over the Moon gave wings to their guardian lions, which they normally don't have. And that's point number two. Having fun is okay. The issue of cultural appropriation it's not about being exactly correct all the time. It's more about using culture like a language. You have to use it in a way that people will understand you. And language means making jokes, playing with meaning. So it's okay to mix and match a little. Now let's look at DC Comics, Batman and the Outsiders, the Lesser Gods volume. There's a story in here that's not part of the main narrative, but it's important for us to look at. In it, they go to Japan. Specifically, they go to Oboke Yokai Village, which is in Tokushima Prefecture, at least according to the comic. 
That's a pretty specific place. In fact, here it is. It's close to Kyoto and Osaka. By being so specific, they're kind of painting themselves into a corner. Furthermore, the story takes place in Oboke Yokai Village, which sounds suspiciously like Obake Yokai Village, which would mean Ghost Goblin Village. That's a really strange name for a place in Japan. The heroes are waiting in some house in a rural village at night, and they're waiting for the appearance of Kuchisake Onna. Kuchisake Onna is a kind of urban legend in Japan. So let's look at that before we see her appearance here in the comic. The story goes something like this. A woman walks up to you with a mask on, and she asks you if you think she's pretty. If you say yes, she removes the mask, revealing a gaping slash from ear to ear across her mouth. And she asks you again, do you think I'm pretty? If you say no, she pulls out a large pair of scissors and kills you on the spot. If you say yes, that she is still pretty, then she takes those scissors and she slashes you across the mouth so that you can be just as pretty as she is. In this DC Comics depiction, although she does say the question, she's dressed in rags, she doesn't really wear the mask, and she has a dislocated jaw like a snake. And her tongue? She has this long, slobbering tongue, which makes her kind of look like Killer Croc. Or, like one of the xenomorphs from the Alien franchise. And I think this is the problem. This depiction of Kuchisake Onna misses the point. She's more of a reflection of the urban fear of the stranger. That anybody wearing a mask could be the monster. Anybody wearing a mask. <clears throat> yes, well, okay, moving on. I think it's important here to make a comparison. Another similar Japanese folkloric monster is the Nopera Bo. And similarly, from behind, looks like a normal person. But when they turn around, they have no face. And it's this sort of anxiety of not being able to trust the people next to you, I think is really important when discussing Kuchisake Onna and Japanese yokai in general. So although this depiction of Kuchisake Onna is kind of creepy, kind of scary, and maybe even a little cool in its own right, it has almost no connection to the Kuchisake Onna in the context of Japan. So there's really no point to set the story in Japan, much less Tokushima. Point three, pay attention to themes and relationships. The things we see in movies, TV shows, and comics, it's a kind of visual language. And language not only has meaning, it also has context. For example, if you say hello to me and my response is thank you, my response is rather nonsensical. Similarly, this DC comic story with Kuchisake Onna, using her the way they do, it's kind of nonsensical. So, let's try to make our own monster. So, the supernatural creature that I want to base my monster design off of is the Baku. It's kind of a Japanese folkloric monster, and it's said to eat people's nightmares. So here we are on the wiki, and it has a few colorful pictures. Let's check out the Japanese version to see what it has. And the pictures are a little bit different, but they're not that significantly different. Now, as I was surfing on the internet, I found this person's blog. And it apparently... At the temple, so there's this temple here, Tenonzan Gohyaku Rakanji, and in it, it has this statue of a Baku king. However, it doesn't seem to be an actual Baku, but some sort of Hakutaku. And Hakutaku is this thing here. Uh, it's another kind of supernatural creature, and it's somewhat of the same genre as a Kirin. And Akiti you're probably familiar with, they're fairly common, and they're even actually part of a beer brand. So, I'm going to take some of the design elements that I see here for the sort of quote-unquote original Baku, and I'm going to combine it with a few of the things here with this Baku King. A little mix and matching.
So here it is. This is what I came up with. So this Baku has a lot of different parts. You can see it has the long nose, and it has the the tiger legs that were part of the uh, the first Baku that we looked at. Now the second Baku, the Baku King, had nine eyes. So I did that as well on this design here with nine eyes, but they're sort of floating around it, kind of like little uh, will o' wisps. And since it's supposed to eat dreams, uh, I made its mouth very prominent, very large. And also in reference to the Baku King, I made its back look a little bit more like those other uh, supernatural creatures, the Hakutaku and the Kirin. Baku is also inspiration for a few Pokemon, like Drowsy and Munna. So I also wanted to try my hand at something kind of cute. Here it is. Since Baku are supposed to eat dreams, I put my Baku into a pair of footy pajamas. And it has a little midnight snack of potato chips in its hand. And a nice, cute, little round tummy full of nightmares. Whoa. Whoa. Oh boy. Oh. So I guess that comes to the final point here. Don't be afraid to change your mind. Design is a learning process. It's important to experiment. And on your first try, if you misunderstood something, it's best that you try again and improve the design that you have. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. Now get out there and draw some monsters!